Good morning, greetings friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, Pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I use nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and sometimes deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your health and vitality and well-being and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health challenge. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 31 years of practicing pharmacy, I've seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes, hypertension, obesity, skin diseases like psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, acne, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure. Because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and while some folks may call that a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health, nutrition, prescription drugs, if you want to wean yourself off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we are here for you, 844 236 6010 is our number on the bright side, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about the longevity products, longevity business, or Truth Skin Health products, if you have a comment or success story you'd like to share, 844-236-6010 is our number on the bright side. If you want to purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised or recommended on the program, please head to my website's brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. We've got blog posts, news stories, as well as videos, and all the longevity products at brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team right off the websites for a one-time $25 fee. You can start yourself a longevity business, help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program. If nutritional supplementation or the longevity products have helped you or your loved ones, and I know so many of you guys have gotten benefits from the Beyond Tangy Tangerine and the Healthy Start Pack and the Fucoid Z and our Ultimate Selenium and Ultimate Niacin. If you've gotten benefits from these longevity products, please help spread the word. You can make some money while you're doing it. Even if you're not interested in making money, just by, you can help change the planet by helping spread the word. Call 866-735-2470 for more information for a one-time $25 fee. You can start a longevity business. You can also just get your products at the wholesale price. If you so desire, call 866-735-2470 for more info. Or you can sign up right off our websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. Also want to remind you to check out our Truth Treatment products at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com, our Truth Retinol 5% gel made with 5% retinol, equity. Potent, same potency as our retin as tretinoin or retinoic acid or retin A, 0.05%. But you're not going to get vitamin C in your retin A, that's for sure. You'll get propylene glycol, you'll get sodium lauryl sulfate, you'll get mineral oil, you'll get preservatives, you'll get the parabens, but you're not going to get vitamin C. Certainly not 25% fat soluble premium vitamin C like you get in our retinol our retinol 5% gel. That's retinol 5% with a big old dose of premium fat soluble vitamin C. If you're dealing with age spots or you want to prevent age spots, if you're dealing with wrinkles or fine lines or you want to prevent wrinkles or fine lines for acne blemishes, retinol is also a go-to active ingredient. If you've tried to use Retin-A in the past or retinol products in the past and haven't been able to, you want to try out our retinol 5% gel. Also, our Truth Transdermal C Serum, Truth Transdermal C Balm, and our Truth Omega-6 Healing Cream. They're all up at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, welcome back to the Bright Side, friends. We have been talking about the thyroid, and we've been talking about hypothyroidism. If you're dealing with chronic fatigue issues, if you just don't feel well, if your skin is dry, if you're losing your hair, if you just don't feel right, chances are pretty darn good that you're hypothyroid. It doesn't matter what the doctor tells you. You don't need to have a thyroid test done. You're the test. We're the test. Our bodies are the test. How we feel is the test. And if you're dealing with a chronic long-term degenerative illness, guaranteed, 100%, no matter what you hear from the doctor, no matter what the tests tell you, you're hypothyroid. 
There's no such thing as a long-term chronic health challenge that does not have hypothyroidism or a, a poorly functioning thyroid behind it. It's the third point on our triangle of disease. It's the jumping off point to all health challenges, period. Don't waste your time with a test. It doesn't matter what they tell you. Diagnostic tests don't matter anyway. Diagnostic tests are based on statistics, not based on individuals. They're based on mass numbers of people. You ask yourself, well, what the heck good is a, is a diagnostic test if it's only statistical and it's only based on large numbers of people? What, what's the point of a diagnostic test? Well, the point is, is that you can't make money on individuals. You can only make money on statistics. Statistics allow us uh, allow the medical model to drug us, allow the medical model to create to, to uh, uh, do surgical procedures on us based on what the statistics say, based on what the numbers say, based on what our test scores say. We've allowed the medical model, i.e., medical salesmen, to define to frame health for us as some kind of risk management issue, not based on how we feel, but based on our risks, which are determined statistically. We've allowed the medical model to frame health as a statistical issue. And I say, uh, we ha when we ta I talk, say we've allowed the medical model to reframe or to frame health as a, st a statistical issue, what I'm really saying is we got to reframe and redefine health. We got to take the definition of health back, not from a, being a statistical issue, but we've got to reframe and redefine health as ease in the body, as a sense of being comfortable in our body, as a sense of our bodies working correctly. It doesn't matter what your thyroid te test score is or your cholesterol test score is. It matters how you feel. It matters the kind of energy you have. It matters the, the, the kind of joy you have for being in a body, for being alive. That's what health is about. Health isn't about our cholesterol scores or our thyroid scores. They'll tell you that's what health is because that's how we get drugged. And that's how we get uh, uh, surgically manipulated. The fact of the matter is, is how we feel should be the primary determinant of our health, regardless of what the doctor tells us, regardless of what our test scores tell us. As far as the thyroid goes, behind all chronic degenerative diseases, you've got a poorly functioning thyroid, period. And guess what? Behind a poorly functioning thyroid, you've got elevated cortisol and you've got digestive problems. And the fact that the thyroid regulates the digestive system means that as our hypothyroidism proceeds, as our poorly functioning thyroid proceeds, proceeds to become poorly functioning, so will our impaired digestion, which will further suppress the thyroid. And this should come as no surprise to anybody. If you're hypothyroid, you are with 100% certainty also dealing with a messed up digestive system, either as a cause or as a result of a poorly functioning thyroid, typically both. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may be aware that you have a digestive health challenge. Perhaps you're constipated. That's typical. Constipation is an epidemic, and it's a classic sign of hypothyroidism. Constant bloating after meals, that could be a problem that, that's associated with hypothyroidism. You may not even be aware that you have a digestive health issue because it's been going on for so long that it's slipped under the radar. But rest assured, there's no such thing as a poorly functioning thyroid that does not involve some kind of digestive disturbance, whether it's leaky gut syndrome, clearance of estrogen, as we talked about yesterday, gallbladder issues, food or digestive intolerances, problem foods, that is. And then we have the whole issue of the microbiome, the gut bacteria. The gut bacteria activate thyroid hormone. The bacteria in the gut are responsible for turning inactive thyroid hormone, so-called T4, into T3, active thyroid hormone. That means antibiotics will wreak havoc on your thyroid. That means chlorine in our water and fluoride in our water will wreak havoc on our, uh, on our uh, 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 thyroid because both chlorine and fluoride are an antibacterial. That means just chlorine in the water and fluoride in the water can have an effect on, a poorly, uh, on our thyroid, can lead to a poorly functioning thyroid. Interestingly, in the case of fluoride, which is used in toothpaste and, and dental rinse, rinses, this antibacterial effect can actually create changes in the mouth flora, which will also play a key role in the health of, in the health of, uh, health of our mouth and play a role in gum disease as well. The same way that the microbiome is important for the health of the intestine, the same way our gut bacteria is important for the health of the intestine, we got bacteria in the mouth that are important for uh, the health of our oral cavity, that is the mouth, especially in, in terms of gum disease. And this effect is even worse, by the way, when our saliva has an acidic pH. I'll talk about that when we come back from our break. I'm pharmacist Ben, you're listening to The Bright Side. We'll be back after this. Okay. 
Okay, we are back on the bright side. I am Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific and 10 to 11 Central Time, 24-7 on our archive pages at brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. Thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that up. You can purchase Longevity products from brightsideben.com off of brightsideben.com as well as pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com. You can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team from the websites brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com, or you can call the phone team at 866-735-2470. That's 866-735-2470 for more information. You can purchase our Truth Treatment products at truthtreatments.com or Retinol 5% Gel. Truth Transdermal C Serum voted one of the top 150 products in the world by Harper's Bazaar Magazine. Our Truth Transdermal C Balm and Truth Omega-6 Healing Cream are all available at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, so chlorine and fluoride in the water can wreak havoc on the microbiome thus causing problems with the thyroid. They can also cause problems with the microbiome, the bacteria that live in our mouth. I had a very interesting conversation with my friend, Dr. Ellie Phillips, who is a alternative dentist in the Austin area. If you're looking for a good dentist in Austin, go check out Dr. Ellie Phillips. She uh, raised some interesting points. She has a book out or soon to have a book out that I'm in the process of reading. I had a conversation with her this morning about bacteria in the mouth and how fluoride rinses and, and dental cleanings and a lot of the strategies we use to take care of our teeth can, can mess up the oral microbiome. That is the gut, that, that is the bacteria that live in the mouth, similarly to antibiotics that we take or fluoride and chlorine that we drink, causing problems with gut bacteria. This effect, as I was saying before, went to break. This effect is even worse when salivary pH is acidic. This can occur when we're toxic, when our body's fighting off some kind of disease, or when we're eating a lot of sugar or eating just subsisting on the standard American diet. When bacteria are, when uh, the, the pH of our saliva is acidic, bacteria are more likely to take up fluoride and fluorine. Dr. Phillips recommends using xylitol gum or xylitol mints postprandially, that is after meals, to raise salivary pH. Hopefully we'll have Dr. Phillips on here in the coming weeks as she talks about her book, as she, uh, when her book comes out, so we have her talking about her book and also her very interesting ideas about the mouth microbiome, the oral microbiome. As far as the thyroid goes, chlorine and fluoride compete with iodine. That's another big problem. Iodine, of course, is required for thyroid hormone to work. This is not to say that you can iodize your way out of hypothyroidism. This is a big mistake that doctors make and sometimes alternative practitioners make. You can't just take iodine to restore the health of the thyroid. Yes, iodine is important. Clearly, iodine is important because thyroid hormone depends on iodine. But iodine supplementation is notoriously unhelpful for folks dealing with hypothyroidism. Unless you're dealing with a full-blown iodine deficiency, and you gotta be very deficient in iodine for this condition to affect your thyroid, you're not gonna get much thyroid benefit by simply supplementing with iodine. And I'm not saying here, not saying here iodine's not important, it's very important. And it's very likely that m most of us are not getting enough iodine, although it's somewhat controversial. Most people, when they think about iodine, think about the thyroid. Sure, that makes sense, because thyroid hormone depends on iodine, but iodine is important for all of the glands in the body. That is, it's important for all of the hormones of the body. All of our hormones work better when we have enough iodine, and all of our hormones will work less effectively under conditions of iodine deficiency, and this is especially important for the hormones of the adrenal glands and the hormones of the reproductive glands and the prostate. That is, the ovaries, the breast, the uterus, as well as the prostate glands. Iodine is also important for developing brains, and all moms, moms-to-be, or breastfeeding moms, should be supplementing with iodine. Iodine is also important for the muscles. You know, one third of our iodine is stored in muscle and deficiencies in iodine are associated with muscle pain, with muscle weakness, fibromyalgia. Iodine is, has an activating uh, nature. It's an activating mineral. There's a very interesting relationship as well between water and iodine. Iodine loses its activity when it's diluted in water. When iodine is in water, it becomes diatomic rather than monoatomic. If you've ever heard of nascent iodine, nascent iodine is monoatomic iodine. That, is, means, that means it exists as one atom. Monoatomic means it's one atom of iodine. Usually iodine is, exists as two atoms put together. 
This is especially true when iodine is in solution. In nature, iodine is largely found in association with water, but specifically ocean water. And this is a little bit different than regular water. Iodine in seaweed and algae is, uh, is especially powerful stuff, and that's because it's protected by organic matter. So it's not really diatomic or monoatomic. It's more like it's organic iodine, and that's why the best way to get your iodine, nutritionally speaking, is from fish and from seaweed and from algae. Nascent iodine is a good form of iodine because it's monoatomic iodine, and there's a lot of good nascent iodine products out on the market. My friend Dr. Edward Group has a good nascent iodine supplement. And nascent iodine, by the way, I've the, the, the anecdotal, reports, that is people who use nascent iodine, their reports are just phenomenal. There's all kinds of things I hear about how nascent iodine helps folks, especially with energy levels. Now, this could have to do with the thyroid. It may also have to do with just overall improvement of glandular and hormonal health. In the body, iodine's attraction to water plays an interesting role in wound healing. Iodine requires the absorption of water for it to proceed effectively as a wound healer. That is, iodine pulls water into wounds so that wounds can heal better. Wounds have to have a certain amount of internal hydration for them to heal. When a wound occurs, one of the body's natural responses to, or I should say when an injury occurs, one of the body's natural wound healing responses to that injury is pulling water to the damaged tissue. This creates a swelling effect that we call inflammation. And while inflammation has kind of a bad connotation, you can't have healing without inflammation. Inflammation is a very, very important part of the, of the healing process. Inflammation precedes healing. And yes, inflammation can be a problem when it's chronic, but after you have an injury, the inflammatory process is absolutely vital for healing to occur. And much of this inflammatory process depends on iodine. That's why Throughout history, at least for the last couple hundred years, iodine has been used post-surgically as a wound healing treatment. In fact, it's a mainstay of medical wound healing protocols since the 1850s or 1860s. The fact that iodine has antiseptic properties as well just adds to the bonus. That adds to the benefits that, uh, uh, it's a bonus to the benefits that iodine has for, he for wound healing. It's antiseptic, it pulls water into the wound to support the inflammatory process. Recently, there's been a whole bunch of scientific papers that have talked about using iodine for helping with scars, helping prevent scar formation. And actually, there's a guy named Derry, D-E-R-R-Y, I forgot his first name, who's written a bunch of papers on using iodine to treat scars after they've already occurred. Now, I don't know whether this works or not, but he says it does. You always want to use topical iodine, by the way, with a little bit of vitamin C. Vitamin C is also important for wound healing and preventing scar formation. That is internally as well as supplementally. So iodine is important for the thyroid. It's important to pro, uh, for thyroid hormone to work effectively. It's important for cortisol to work effectively. Iodine deficiency can change how cortisol levels are, how cortisol is secreted. It can, it can negatively affect cortisol levels, stress hormone levels. Iodine is incredibly important for breast health. Fibrocystic breast disease is dependent, or, or recovery from fibrocystic breast disease is dependent on iodine, iodine supplementation that is. Iodine is an activating molecule. And iodine is especially important for thyroid hormone, for the effectiveness of thyroid hormone, T4 and T3, as they're called. T4, by the way, means four pieces of iodine. T3 means three pieces of iodine. We'll talk about this tomorrow as we continue discussing iodine, hypothyroidism, fluoride. Water is the single most important. Okay, we're back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Got lines open for you at 844-236-6010. If you have questions about anything we're speaking about here today, if you're hypothyroid, you want help with that. If you've got adrenal health issues, if you've got questions about nascent iodine or iodine in general, if you've got a comment or success story, if you have questions about our Truth Skin Health products or the longevity products, 844-236-6010 is our phone number on the bright side. We'll get your calls here in just a sec. We do have lines open. 844-236-6010 is our number. Tomorrow we'll continue talking about T4 and T3, the two forms of thyroid hormone, T4 being inactive or weakened thyroid hormone. This is the kind of thyroid hormone that you'll get pharmacologically. If you go to the doctor, you'll call Synthroid or Levothyroxine. T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone. Four and three, the numbers four and three refer to the amount of iodine atoms or pieces of iodine that are attached to the hormone. 
in order for thyroid hormone to become activated, a piece of iodine has to be stripped off. This is accomplished by gut bacteria, which means you got to have a healthy microbiome. Got to have healthy gut bacteria in order to activate thyroid hormone. And it's why Synthroid is notoriously in levothyroxine, even though they're always in the top 10 best selling drugs every year. These are notoriously ineffective medications. If you are hypothyroid, and again, you're hypothyroid, you can rest assured you're hypothyroid if you're dealing with a long term chronic health challenge. If you're hypothyroid, it's more than a matter of just taking thyroid hormone, it's more than a matter of just taking iodine. Anyway, we'll continue talking about this tomorrow on the bright side. 844-236-6010 is our number. We'll get your calls here in just a sec. From uh, EPFL's Laboratory of Nanoscale Biology, this was published in the journal Nature, electricity generated with water, salt, and a membrane. Simply by putting a membrane between fresh water and salt water, you can actually generate an electrical charge as the electrolytes in the salt water pass through the membrane and enter into, uh, or as the, the fresh water enters into the salt water through the membrane. This is very important because it acknowledges or it takes advantage of the relationship between electrolytes in water and electrical energy. I've said this for years. Electrolytes in water generate an electrical charge. You can take advantage of this property by spinning electrolytes in water in a blender. Where do you get electrolytes? Celtic sea salt, beyond tangy tangerine, vegetable juices, just plain old vegetables have lots of electrolytes in them. If you spin electrolytes in a vortex in a blender, whether it's in your Beyond Tangy Tangerine or Celtic Sea Salt or in vegetables, you will get energy that is far superior to the amount of energy that you get just by eating vegetables or just by using electrolytes supplementally. The spinning action of the blender will create so much energy that when you drink your vegetable juice or drink your electrolyte water or your salt water, you'll notice that you're getting much more energy than you would just by drinking ordinary vegetable juice or by drinking ordinary salt water or by drinking ordinary Beyond tangy tangerine. In other words, the spinning of the electrolytes in the vortex creates an electrical charge. The movement of the electrolytes in the water creates an electrical charge. And this was described in this uh, paper in the journal Nature. They measured an electrical charge as fresh water flowed through a membrane to dilute the salt water in uh, in uh, in a second a second compartment that was uh, that was made up of I believe ocean water. So as fresh water passed through the membrane, diluted the salt water, an electrical charge was generated. And also, by the way, an electrical charge can be generated as salt water uh, enters into uh, passes through a membrane and enters into fresh water. It's the movement of electrolyte rich water that actually generates an electrical charge. And it's very likely that this movement of electrolyte rich fluid is what accounts for the electrical charge that's in blood. Blood generates an electrical charge as it circulates through the body. This electrical charge is called a zeta potential, and it's one of the reasons why sticky, sludgy blood that follows digestive toxicity typically is such a problem. As the blood becomes sticky and sludgy, it generates less of an electrical charge. We become less electrical beings. One of the major reasons why the blood is the life, as it says in the Bible, the life of the body is in the blood, is because the blood generates an electrical charge, sticky, sludgy blood that follows digestive toxicity can reduce that electrical charge. And just like thyroid hormone or Synthroid is in the top 10 best-selling drugs every year, every year, so are blood thinning drugs. It's like we have an epidemic of hypothyroidism and we have an epidemic of sticky, sludgy, thick blood. All right, from uh, the journal Skin Inc., microneedling opens the door for rosacea relief. Microneedling may offer promise as a treatment for clients with rosacea. This was, uh, according to research presented at the American Academy of Dermatology's annual meeting earlier this year. Microneedling is when they run a, a, um, a bunch of tiny little needles on a roller across the skin. It's used to stimulate collagen production. It's quite effective, actually. But now we're finding out that this can actually improve not only uh, rosacea-prone skin, but it can also improve wound healing, for scar, uh, improve acne scars, especially when microneedling is done in conjunction with alpha-hydroxy acids, that is, glycolic acid. Microneedling is, you can think of as a exercise for the skin by rolling uh, uh, tiny little microscopic needles, not really microscopic, but very, very tiny needles across the skin. You can stimulate co collagen production. You can stimulate the growth of skin cells. You can also stimulate uh, the production of anti-inflammatory chemicals that are found in the skin. 
This is called, by the way, the, this process is known as hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. Hormesis is the idea that stress in the body can actually be beneficial. Stress in the body, whether it's uh, exercise, which is a type of stress, or stress in the body, whether it's uh, ingestion of, of uh, homeopathic medicines, or whether it's from eating lots of vegetables. Yes, vegetables create a stress on the body. The, the, what we call phytonutrients create tiny amounts of stress on the liver, which result in the production of anti-aging and anti-cancer and youth-promoting chemicals. A little bit of stress, as it turns out, is a good thing, and this can show up on the skin in terms of microneedling. It can also show up in the skin in terms of using just plain old apple cider vinegar on your skin, which can create a mild hormetic, um, uh, a, a subclinical type of stress like microneedling. Microneedling treatments are available at uh, most estheticians these days and most dermatologists too. All right, so let's see. I'll give you one more study here and then we'll get your phone calls. 844-236-6010 is our number. This is from Nutritional Neuroscience. Acute effects of a very low carbohydrate diet on sleep. It turns out that a very low carbohydrate diet over the short term promotes better sleep, promotes increases in the percentage of deep sleep stage four. And, uh, and this can be used for folks who are dealing with insomnia or dealing with sleep apnea issues. You'll get better sleep if you go on a low-carbohydrate diet. That is where the ketogenic diet excels. Ketogenic diet, of course, is a low-carbohydrate, low-calorie. Remember, low-carbohydrate and low-calorie diet. All right, one more, and then we'll get your calls. 844-236-6010. Some sunscreen ingredients may disrupt sperm cell function. This is from the Endocrine Society. Many ultraviolet filtering chemicals commonly used in sunscreen interfere with the function of human, uh, human sperm cells. Uh, results of this study will be presented at the uh, Endocrine Society's 98th annual meeting in Boston. Sunscreens are not nice chemicals, and any dermatologist, medical professional, health professional of any kind who recommends using a sunscreen should be regarded with great skepticism. Anybody who understands even a whit of chemistry or biochemistry understands that if you put a sunscreen on your skin, you are wreaking havoc on not just the skin's health, but also on internal health. Yes, internal health because sunscreens are absorbed into the bloodstream. Perhaps not large amounts of it, but the way the American Academy of Dermatology recommends using sunscreen, this, uh, and that is to slather on huge amounts of it and to keep, keep reapplying it. This increases the likelihood of the entrance of sunscreen into the blood supply, and this can have negative effects on the hormone system, particularly when it comes to sperm cells. All right, 844 is our number. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side. We're coming back with you and your phone calls right after this. this back on the bright side. I'm pharmacist Ben. 844-236-6010 is our number. Got lines open for you. 844-236-6010. Let's go to Oregon and say good morning to Mary. How you doing, Mary? Welcome to the bright side. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this question, but if anybody knows it, you will. Okay. Uh, I appreciate another... the confidence. I hope I don't let you down. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, keto podcasts out there and on one of the keto podcasts, um, I heard that the blood pressure medicine interferes with their ability to lose weight. And so I passed that on to my friend, and they wanted more details. Which kind of blood? Now, there's different kinds of blood pressure medicine, so I'm not sure which ones you're talking about here. I haven't it's heard of that. It's on lisinopril. Lisinopril, okay. Okay, so whenever you hear pril like lisinopril or captopril, you're dealing with a special kind of blood pressure lowering drug that is actually thought to be a little bit less toxic than some of the other uh, blood, pressure lowering, uh, blood pressure lowering drugs. It works with the kidneys. Kidneys are your main blood pressure organs or, or blood pressure stabilizing organs. Kidneys and the adrenal glands, the renals and the adrenals. And so the thinking is, is by changing how the kidneys absorb or don't absorb electrolytes, you can have an effect on the blood pressure. This is just stupid logic. And it really is kind of a, a, a poster child for the absolute intellectual and biochemical bankruptcy, moral bankruptcy even, of using drugs to treat the body. How dare any healthcare professional think that it's a, uh, think that it's a good thing to poison the kidneys in any way, shape, or form? It's offensive, it's twisted, it's evil. The kidneys, are you kidding me? 
You're going to drug somebody's kidneys to lower their blood pressure? Doctor, what are you thinking? I can see why drug companies would do it because they're profiting off of it, as evil as that may be. But a healthcare professional? Please. My these, these Pril drugs are said to be ACE inhibitor drugs. Without getting into too much biochemistry, they change the way minerals are absorbed or not absorbed into the blood, thereby dropping the blood pressure. The, if you've, you've, everybody's probably heard of the idea that by going on a low, we, we've, we've kind of debunked the whole myth of a low salt diet. But the theory is, or the thinking is, is that when salt, that is minerals or electrolytes enter into the blood, they pull water with them. This is an effect that electrolytes have, that minerals have. They suck up water. Think of, think of like a sponge. The way a sponge sucks up water, minerals suck up water. And so when minerals enter into the bloodstream, Water will be sucked up, and this will expand the blood volume. This expansion of the blood volume raises the pressure. Just think of a garden hose. The more water we have in the garden hose, the more pressure there's going to be against the blood vessels or against the garden hose. Same way in the blood vessels. The more pressure there is, the more water there is in the blood, in the, uh, blood the greater the pressure against the blood wall. So by increasing the amount of, of salt or electrolytes that are excreted out of the body, the thinking goes, you'll decrease blood volume. Now, this doesn't work when it comes to salt intake because the salt is tightly regulated chemically. You can't just stop eating salt and then expect your blood pressure to drop. It's not how it works because when you stop eating salt, the kidney will just hold on to more salt. So then the brilliant pharmacological medical model says, okay, well, we'll just drug the kidneys. We'll just poison the kidneys. I'm not being, I'm not being poetic here. I'm being literal. We're going to poison the kidneys so they cannot do their work of absorbing minerals or keeping minerals into the blood. The minerals will be more likely to get dumped out of the blood, especially potassium, by the way. By dumping these minerals out of the blood, poisoning the kidneys with your ACE inhibitor, with your captopril-type drug, the thinking goes, you're now going to lower your blood pressure. This is just dumb, dumb, dumb. Aside from the fact that we really don't know what hypertension is, at least when it's not extreme. You probably heard, Mary, that they just lowered the bar for, for whether you're hypertensive, hypertensive or not. It used to be 140, now it's 130. So now a, a good 50% more Americans are so-called hypertense, have high blood pressure. That means millions and millions more Americans are now going to be drugged, have to be drugged by, via standards of care. Do you know when, when your, uh, your, G, your general practitioner determines that you've got elevated blood pressure based on these arbitrary designations, he has to drug you because that's the standard of care. If he doesn't drug you, he's liable. So he has to drug you, or at least he has to write you a prescription. Whether you take it or not is your business, I suppose, but he has to write you a prescription. If you are hypertense, it's not a medical issue. It's a lifestyle issue. Let me say that again. If you are supposedly hypertense, because again, we don't really know what high blood pressure is, but if you are, if you believe that your pressure is high, it has to do with your, how you're handling your lifestyle, especially how you're eating, and also stress management. Elevated blood pressure is a sign that the body's sympathetic stress nervous system has been activated. The answer is not to poison the kidneys to have it dump out potassium. The answer is to relax your body. And I've said this so many times, I'll say it again. You can prove it to yourself by running a hot bath. Take your blood pressure, see where it's at, sit in a bathtub for 10 minutes, not a hot bath, but a warm bath. I had one guy call me up. He said, I took a hot bath and my blood pressure went up. I said, well, how hot was the water? Well, it was pretty hot. Well, yeah, that's going to raise your blood pressure because that will activate the emergency response. But a nice warm bath, nice soothing warm bath. Watch what that does to your blood pressure. That's all you need to lower your blood pressure. Now, you can't sit in the bathtub, obviously, all day long, but you can take one bath a day. You can take two baths a day. And in the meantime, when you're not taking a bath, make sure you're practicing slow, deep breathing. Stress management. I know this is a nutritional program, but I'm telling you what, folks, we got to learn how to handle stress. And we hear the word stress all the time, but as I've said so many times before, it's not stress, it's strain that is the problem. Stress is just what happens to the body. Strain is how the body responds to stress. And that's really the key element when it comes to the stress response. How do we respond to stress? If we respond to stress with an activated sympathetic nervous system, our blood pressure is going to go up, growth and repair will be suppressed, as will the immune system. We're going to look lousy, we're going to feel lousy, and we're going to be running higher risks for all kinds of chronic long-term degenerative diseases, including heart disease. That's really the problem. It's not the blood pressure. It's the activated sympathetic nervous system. 
And this idea that you can drug the body back to health is just goes back to what I was saying, how we treat ourselves. The medical model treats us based on our numbers, not on our health. It uses diagnostics. It uses test scores. It doesn't care about our overall health. It cares about our numbers. So if you got high blood pressure or you think you have high blood pressure or you want to lower your blood pressure, relax the body. It's not a good reason to take a drug. In fact, there's no good reason to take a drug with the exception of, of in the short term, perhaps if you have a, an infection that you have to deal with or pain pills, uh, if you're in some kind of uh, acute pain, not chronic pain, because that's another problem, chronic pain, uh, using, using uh, pain pills to treat chronic pain. But if you have acute pain, like post-surgical pain, or if you twist your ankle or break a leg or something along those lines, yes, there's a need for pain pills. But other than that, anytime you're on a long-term, on a drug long-term, your number one health challenge should be to figure out how to get off of that drug. Do it with your doctor. If you've got a healthcare professional taking care of you, you don't want to get, just get off of the drug because that's not fair to the healthcare professional, but it's your right to tell your doctor, I don't want to be on this drug long term. I want to wean myself off of it, and there's no better way to wean yourself off of a prescription drug than to use nutritional supplements. When it comes to high blood pressure, magnesium is a natural antihypertensive substance, maybe the best. Niacin is also good. Niacin, maybe uh, time-release niacin. You get that uh, uh, ultimate niacin off young, uh, from uh, your longevity rep or call 866-735-2470. It's an awesome way to lower your blood pressure. One, uh, one or two time-release niacin a day. 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of magnesium a day will also lower blood pressure. Potassium has an antihypertensive effect, interestingly. Uh, what else here? GABA, G-A-B-A, has an antihypertensive effect. The amino acid glycine, the amino acid taurine, the amino acid arginine all have antihypertensive effects. Anything you can do to stabilize your blood sugar will also have antihypertensive effects. And laying off the sugar is also a good strategy. And don't forget your relaxation, your psychological, mental, and emotional relaxation strategies. Is that too much info there for you, Mary? No, super. Thank you. Anything else going on? Um, is there someone else on the line? Uh, we're running out of time. We're not going to take any more calls. So if you got anything okay. else, now's the yeah, time. Yeah, just real quickly, for my own self, um, since I'm keto, I uh, take the vitamin E that you said. Okay. And then I heard... Anytime, you, let me just add this. Anytime you're doing more fat, you need more vitamin E. Vitamin E's main role in the body is to protect fat. So the more fat you're taking, you're eating, especially uh, polyunsaturated fats, vegetable oil type fats, omega-3 and omega-6 fats, the more vitamin E you need. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mary. So I started out taking 800 IUs of the mixed tocopherols, and then one day you said to drop down to 400. But I also have eye uh, connective tissue issues, and and so would the 800 be okay? Yeah, it's not. 800 is not bad. You know, there's no. I, I know of no literature that talks about any negative effects to any dose of vitamin E. I, I think a little diarrhea if you take way too much. All right, we're just out of time, Mary. Apologize. Thank you so much for your call. Appreciate it. Have a great day in Oregon. And uh, that's it for now. Thanks for listening to the Bright Side Friends. Check out my truth treatment products at truthtreatments.com and all the longevity products at pharmacistben.com, criticalhealthnews.com, and brightsideben.com. Have yourselves a wonderful, awesome, beautiful, spectacular day. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll talk to you all later, folks. Bye for now. Thank you.